Okay, um, just so you know, this session will be recorded. And now I would like to introduce our guest speaker today, Phineas Baxendahl, who will be speaking on university campuses as leaders in the shift away from driving. Phineas Baxendahl is a senior policy analyst at US Public Interest Research Group, also known as PERG. And he directs the program on tax and budget issues, as well as transportation. Dr. Baxendahl holds a PhD in political science from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and a Bachelor of Arts in Economics from Wesleyan University. Dr. Baxendahl is a leading expert in his field and has appeared on numerous talk shows and conducted studio interviews and debates for outlets such as CNN, MSNBC, Fox, and PBS. His opinion editorial pieces have appeared in dozens of newspapers across the country, and he has been quoted in numerous publications, such as the New York Times, Washington Post, and The Economist. He often presents at conferences and has given invited testimony and public comment to state legislatures, Congress, and the U.S. Department of Transportation. His blogs appear on the National Journal Transportation Expert blog, Huffington Post, and Streets blog. At U.S. PERC, he has authored or co-authored dozens of reports, including a series examining the end of America's driving boom, a series on infrastructure privatization, and a series on state government spending transparency. And with that, I'd like to welcome you, Phineas, and I'll give it over to you. Well, thank you. And uh, I'd also just like to thank the Center for Urban Transportation Research for inviting me to, to give this webinar. Um, just to briefly say something about the U.S. Public Interest Research Group, um, Trying to advance the slide here. I don't know if it's up. Oh, there we go. Uh, so we are uh, an organization that's been around for about 40 years. We're a nonprofit, nonpartisan consumer advocacy group uh, with a real research component that I uh, uh, do my work through. We're a membership-based citizen organization. We have uh, state affiliates, including. Florida Perg there at USF, there near USF, uh, plus a, a DC federal office, and our, our funding comes mostly from these small contributions from these hundreds of thousands of citizens. The transportation research here is presented, uh, is uh, supported uh, by the Rockefeller Foundation, and most of it has been done in collaboration with a colleague of mine, uh, Tony Dutzig, who's at the Frontier Group, uh, another nonpartisan policy think tank. I want to, um, in, I'm going to talk here in a way kind of re reversing the direct, the, uh, the title to be, to be talking really about the shift away from driving and the, how university, uh, campuses fit into that, uh, kind of the reverse direction of what the title is. Um, so talking first about the shift in driving and how, uh, this trend has been led by younger Americans some explanations about this shift and its implications, and then that really coalesces and how, uh, why this has been particularly important for universities and why they play an important role here. I want to, before getting into describing the driving trends more broadly, just to give us kind of snapshot of uh, one university, uh, the University of North Carolina, UNC, which was looking at a, a big campus expansion at the end of the 1990s and realized that they were going to have large problems with, with parking, congestions, and really keeping the campus feeling like a place that people wanted to be and which had a sense of place. And then in 2002, they launched a couple of programs with the explicit goal of reducing the number of students and staff who drove to campus. At, at the time, there had been 30% uh, of students and three-quarters of staff were, were driving and this was already creating problems. So one of the things they did is they worked with the Chapel Hill Transit Agency uh, to contribute to have an agreement where they were contributing directly to their budget, and in return what they were going to do was make uh, service be fare-free, and this would uh, allow service to be much more convenient, to be sped up for people to not have to dig in their pockets for change. They could enter from any door. Uh, onto the bus instead of just in the front, et cetera. It also uh, helped something else they launched, which was something called the Commuter Alternative Program. And this was something which they paid for with uh, parking fees and student fees, as well as a grant from the North Carolina Department of Transportation. What, what this did for those joining the Commuter Alternative Program 
who lived off campus, was if they joined and weren't going to travel uh, uh, by themselves by car to campus, then they would have not just this free access to the transit operator, but they would also have a discount on the monthly van pool rides, a huge discount, uh, as well as a huge discount on uh, the Zipcar membership, free ride matching service for carpooling, and a free emergency ride service uh, provided by the university when there were unexpected events or emergencies, re reasons why they uh, just needed to, a, a car immediately on, on occasion. So by providing this, they made it possible, and they found some, some real results. So by 2011, there was only 18% of students and only half of the staff were driving solo to campus, and this was a big change. Uh, the proportion of students who were using transit had ramped up from just 21% to 53% of students. Um, and the free transit service with the stable funding helped the transit agency itself expand not just for students but more generally to become a major force, one of the largest agencies in, in the state, um, as well as just uh, being more useful and more used by the students. So that's something I just uh, put out there. People have a, a kind of picture of w how universities can play a really a dramatic and aggressive role in the kind of changes, both reacting to the trends I'm talking to and, and helping to further them. So the trend I'm talking about starts, uh, uh, it is a, a break from what had been the past. The, the uh, time after World War II, is a time that uh, I refer to as the driving boom. Uh, you can see how uh, the darker line, the vehicle miles traveled, and the dotted line, the per capita vehicle miles traveled, uh, each with uh, different uh, uh, different uh, vertical access. They're, uh, they're connected to here to see the, the scale. You can see really steady increases over the time, unless there was a temporary little blip from an OPEC oil shock, you could kind of predicting that driving was going to increase the next year was a little bit like predicting that the sun was going to shine the next morning, something which was, was very steady and uh, which most transportation planners, I think, got used to just assuming it was always going to be the case. And then, um, well, there were a bunch of things that were kind of behind this trend all at the same time. There was not just the rising workforce participation and the baby boom, which meant a lot of people who were of peak driving age came about that 35 to 54 roughly area where people tend to drive the most. Um, it also meant uh, this creation of new suburbs and population shifting out of cities, you know, being places where land use patterns encourage more driving, and gasoline was cheap. And then you see a saturation in, in certain, um, uh, increase to saturation point of certain uh, trends such as people owning a car became universal. Driver's licensing also became near universal. As I list this, you may notice that these are, are, are each trends which have either you know, reached a saturation point or some way peaked or, or actually reversed which um, brings us to, to the next slide, which really shows what happened at, after, uh, after 2004. You see um, the dotted line, the vehicle miles traveled per capita as the kind of leading indicator has now uh, decreased. We've had nine years in a row in which people on average drive less than they did the year before, something really, really unprecedented. It's been about a 7.5% decline or even larger depending on how you measure population. We're, we're currently uh, driving at, at uh, levels that weren't seen since the uh, Clinton administration. And, and this, this kind of other direction in these driving trends is something which is really, really a change, a kind of break from the unmitigated pattern of the post-war era. And you can see it in, in total driving miles where you see a, a real definite downturn and then in ongoing stagnation in, in total driving miles as, as well. I'm going to bring you to the next slide just to see this on the uh, uh, Federal Highway Administration website, which shows this in terms of the 12-month moving average. And you can see the peak there and then the kind of uh, 
ongoing stagnation in driving there. Um, this is a trend which is not just driven by a few uh, large population states. This is something which is true just about everywhere in America. Um, the green states being those with reductions in driving and darker green being bigger reductions. North Dakota with its big uh, fracking energy boom has a lot of uh, new folks driving around and sometimes having to drive long distances to work at those uh, plants. Uh, some of these other states actually, if you move the date that you start to measure back a year or two, they actually are experiencing declines in driving as well. It's really only North Dakota and Alabama which have a decline in driving no matter what year you're starting at. So this is, this is something really quite broad as a trend. Um, Florida, just for the uh, uh, location of the, the center, I'll just detail Florida here where the total vehicle miles traveled are down 15 billion miles since 2007, uh, again showing this, this trend. Um, and we looked also at uh, urbanized areas as defined by the census. Some of them are hard to compare uh, from year to year, but where you do look at them, you can see almost everywhere the proportion of commuters who travel by private vehicle has fallen. The vast majority of places have seen increases in biking, decreases in multi-car households, and although the data isn't comparable across years for every area, the strong majority of places that have comparable data see reductions in driving and increases in transit trips. I'm going to look here. You can see the dark blue dots. You can see the decreases in uh, driving miles per capita uh, in the states where there's comparable data. I, I list some of the Florida cities here on the side so you can get a a uh, taste of that as, as well for the Florida folks. And uh, one last measure of this, we don't have enough of these household travel surveys, but there is a recent California household travel survey, which was done in 2000 and again in 2012, and shows a more than doubling in the share of uh, walking, biking, and public transit trips that happen on a typical day. So, that, you know, again, every way you look at it, it's a really kind of dramatic break from the past and a very definite trend. Um, when we looked at the national household travel surveys, which were conducted in 2001 and 2009, two different, uh, both recession years, um, luckily for our point of comparison, we saw something topped out in the data, which was that this was much stronger among millennials, uh, younger folks. Uh, were, were born in the years before 2000, uh, and we found a, a almost a quarter reduction in driving miles when you looked at uh, those who were 16 to 34 years old. The way that, that was the way the data to be taken, the way they break it down there, and um, you know this is something which was true really no matter how you cut it. There were fewer drivers, fewer trips, shorter trips. It's also something that you see mirrored when you look at the uh, Federal Highway uh, licensure data about driver's licenses. You see a, a definite uh, decline in uh, people who bother to get a driver's license, so that while there were 21 percent of 14 to 34-year-olds who lacked a driver's license in 2000, that number had, been, had increased to over a quarter at 26 percent by 2010. Um, more on millennials, it's not just that they were not traveling, they were actually switching to other modes uh, so that you see 40% more transit miles, uh, about a quarter more bike trips, and 16% more likely to, to walk uh, as, a, as a way of travel. And uh, you see, you can see from this that the younger uh, somebody was, for, for the younger groups, uh, they're even more likely to have reduced their driver's licensure. So this is something which uh, is the kind of cutting edge seems to be stronger with the uh, with the generation coming in even more so. I'm going to uh, – this is hard to see, I realize, but as you can see the survey data, they ask people 
whether they're consciously seeking out to switch from driving to other modes, you can see that the younger people are, the more likely they're, they agree with the statement that this is something that they do. You know, and, and a really pretty significant, uh, I think quite impressive, 43% say that they uh, at least somewhat are trying to switch, uh, consciously are switching modes away from driving as something they want to do. Uh, Similarly, if you ask people where they want to live, and you say, is it uh, is a four-point scale, and you, this shows for those who said most strongly that it, that it was very important for them to live somewhere that was near bus or, or rail lines, you can see def definitively the younger people are uh, show a stronger sentiment this way, and a pretty strong sentiment at that. Uh, the real estate agent, uh, the real estate industry has been clear about this. They say that there's uh, this large generation Y uh, wants to is willing to live in in very small apartment units so long as their neighborhoods have uh, amenities and access to mass transit. This is this is really a pronounced characteristic of, of this generation. This is all. Um, kind of information that decision makers have to have uh, at least implicitly when they make decisions about uh, durable infrastructure such as transportation and land use decisions, they have to be implicitly looking at a kind of crystal ball about what are people going to want, what are people going to use for the future, what what should be prioritized. And, and what you can see in this next slide is that departments of transportation have been very slow to learn about this trend. You can see the upward slopes in predicted uh, driving miles, you know, back in 1999. And these predictions uh, change very little at, with ongoing years that, um, you know, these uh, department, U.S. DOT uh, national predictions, which are made up from the state DOTs sending them their state uh, forecasts of what they're expecting driving to do. And, uh, you know, pretty much it's it's a, you know, somebody has showed this to characterize this as a kind of head-in-the-sand approach that, you know, oh, no, driving is going to increase the way it always did. It's just going to start next year, and it's going to be just like it always was. And you can see the black line shows the re the reality has been quite different, but has done very little to shape how uh, transportation officials are approaching their decisions and their predictions that, that form what kind of uh, priorities will be acted upon uh, in the future. Uh, we did our, our own study where we focus on scenarios of what the millennials in particular are going to do, whether they're going to go back to Peak, the peak driving uh, levels uh, that were in 2005, whether there's, their um, values will be in, instilled to the next generation or, or whether it's going to kind of freeze. And you can see the total um, vehicle miles are, are quite different, but in every scenario are much less than what the driving boom would have predicted as it had continued during that post-war period. So we really are in a time of, of, of great change. It's, it's one that uh, the Fitch, the bond rating agency, uh, notes the decline in driving and the increased use of public transit. And they say, in our view, transportation needs of the last 50 years will be markedly different from those of the past 50 years. And U.S. policymakers must begin adapting their current decisions to those future needs. So... Um, you can hear it from a lot of reasons, and I, I, I think it's something which is hard to make sense of and is, is very much happening around us, but uh, has not been adequately explained, partly because there's real conflicting, though overlapping, ways to explain what has gone on. You know, is, is this kind of attitudes and culture? Is this the economy? Is this technology? Those seem to be the, the main kind of explanations for this. And let me start with um, the attitudes and culture. We've talked about some of the uh, surveys show this. So the, the way people talk about this more broadly is in terms of the growing desire to live in cities. You know, we've had the last two years of data, or the first two years in, in uh, 
you know, over 90 years worth of data where cities, central cities have grown faster than their surrounding suburbs. There seems to be something which is going on there. People talk about the end of the love affair with the car, America's love affair with the car, and it's really hard to evaluate claims like that. But you, where there are cross um, uh, surveys which happen repeatedly from year to year, such as those where they ask people their 10 favorite brands, it used to be that uh, auto companies were, you know, hugely overrepresented in those surveys, and now they just don't appear at all. Um, you can also ask whether cars still represent freedom the way they they once did, once when people uh, lived typically in you know, cramped little houses with several siblings and didn't have internet access, and access to a car was kind of their way to open up uh, experience with a larger world, and, and all those things have have kind of changed in, in a way that, uh, you know, is very hard to measure, but may, may be an important part of how people experience the world and experience the role of cars in that world. Um, it may also be that uh, other kinds of technology is supplanting automobiles for how people connect with their peers and what they look to as signs of, of status. Um, in terms of <coughs> other signs of these changing aspirations, the American Planning Association did a recent survey where they asked millennials and uh, what, uh, where they want to live and, and how they want to live their lives. And 81% say that the affordable and convenient transportation alternatives to the car are at least somewhat important when deciding where to live and work. And only 8% said that they would prefer to live, uh, if they can afford it, that they would prefer to live somewhere um, uh, other than, uh, sorry, I don't know if I wrote this right, they would prefer not to, to live in a suburb where most people drive to most places, even though 41% believe that they now live in such suburbs. And looking to the future, you know, um, this is really hard to imagine just a decade ago, but 31 percent, uh, much larger than what the actuals are right now, but 31 percent say that they want some combination of these uh, alternatives to, to driving, you know, trains, rail, cars, buses, carpooling, car sharing, ride sharing, anything other than, um, than just solo driving, that they want that to be their primary way of getting around. And a strong majority feel that there's not enough alternative options to, to right now in their area. So this is this is uh, where where people are in in their sentiments. But sentiments can be mushy. That you know, I think there's a, a desire to explain this as as something which me, must be more driven by the economy, and that perhaps uh, uh, the economy can explain that this is just some temporary change which is going to go away and we'll, we can go back to the driving boom that we always knew. Um, you know, after all, more commerce means more travel, more trucks, more people going to business meetings or going out to the movies. The data show us that employed people are about twice as likely as unemployed people, sorry, that they, not twice as likely, they drive twice as many miles as unemployed people. And um, we do, you know, see that gas prices were higher in their pre-2000 levels than they have been since. Uh, so that can make you think that perhaps if the economy, you know, begins to continue heating up, uh, that driving might return to what was the old normal. But there really are some strong reasons to think otherwise. Um, for one, the timing of the recession just doesn't match this. Uh, you know, back in 2005, uh, driving was already in the sharp uh, kind of downturn happening on a per capita basis, and uh, the recession didn't hit until the end of 2007, really 2008. So it's hard to think that people were cutting their driving in 2006 because they knew Lehman Brothers was going to um, go bankrupt and the recession was going to happen uh, in 2007, 2008. Similarly, we're... Uh, next month is going to be five years out of the official recession, five years since it ended, and yet we continue to see this very persistent pattern of reduced driving. Uh, another thing is if you look at the data, if you look at uh, youth who earn more than $70,000 a year and you look at employed youth, you also see a big reduction in driving. Um, I'm going to get at some of these other reasons in, in some of the other slides. 
um, first of them that uh, vehicle miles traveled and economic growth used to just be totally linked with each other. Almost, if you look over time, they're almost just complete shadows uh, moving in tandem. And then something happened. It's really hard to say what, but uh, GDP and VMT no longer seem to be linked the way they once were. Um, you even see them, you know, often diverging now. Uh, something that which really would have been unthinkable and isn't yet uh, isn't yet reflected in most of our kind of models for forecasting travel patterns. Um, gas prices you don't see a real uh, consistent pattern between gas prices and uh, driving over time. And in fact, insofar as there's any correlation, it seems to be getting weaker over time. Uh, the uh, I'm going to show you here if you can see here the change in unemployment during the recession for the 50 states, and then you can see uh, how much uh, driving either went up for a few states or went down for most states. So if driving was the result of the recession, you'd expect to see most states lined up kind of between Louisiana and Florida. Somewhere, you know, the more a state was hit by the recession, the more reduction in driving. But you do, you really don't see that. They're they're all over the map, and there's uh, no real clear pattern there. In fact, among the 23 states with above average declines in um, in driving, uh, only about a quarter of them were also above average in their gains in unemployment. And if you uh, I won't go through the data here, but the similar thing happens when you look at uh, urbanized areas, uh, either for poverty or unemployment rates. You see uh, a lack of clear connection between the economy and driving patterns. So um, uh, lastly, even if insofar as it is the economy which is behind these changes, uh, it doesn't mean that um, we can uh, assume that they're uh, temporary or don't matter. You know, we don't. We can't assume that uh, the really exceptional high growth of the post-war period uh, is going to be is go is the normal that we'll return to. Uh, we can't assume that uh, the cheap gas that we used to have will be the norm. And we similarly can't assume that there'll be uh, this high student debt, which is sometimes cited for millennials' uh, aversion to buying cars, uh, is something which is going to just magically disappear, much as I might want to for my uh, two kids. Uh, that just seems to not be the case. Uh, moreover, things which may start as having economic causes, especially for uh, the millennials who ha have now really experienced uh, young adulthood as a time, as a shift away from driving, these establish habits and expectations that can really be uh, lifelong kinds of patterns established by um, how people live and, and what they expect and aspire to as, as younger adults. Uh, technology, I'll, I'll move through this quickly, but it, it's you know, no, no news to you all that uh, we live in a time of real dramatic change. I think most of us can forget that back in 2000, there still wasn't the smartphones. They're, they're incredibly recent. And now, well, this is 2012 data showing that about half of people are, are carrying around these mobile, internet-connected, location-aware devices. And um, I think most people realize that this is uh, something which has been adapted much more quickly by younger people. Uh, so it may be, that's one reason to think this may be part of the trend. And technology is, is uh, something which doesn't just uh, become an alternative to how people might connect they, they, or they shop by uh, online instead of going to the mall or, or on Facebook instead of going out um, maybe to, to meet people at the mall. Um, but there's also these t technology enabled uh, uh, Smartphones make possible the kind of car sharing, the modern ride sharing, and bike sharing. Uh, you know, when I uh, used bike share uh, this morning, I checked to make sure where there was going to be bikes and then where I could dock it and uh, having the confidence to be able to look at, uh, at my smartphone that way really made it a lot easier t to do that. Uh, similarly, mobile tech has helped the transit experience that you know 
how long it's going to be till your um, bus or train is going to arrive. You can uh, check maybe with onboard Wi-Fi. You will have checked your email by the time you arrive at, off at the office. You can, even if you're not an expert on your transit system, apps make it very easy to figure out how to get somewhere, et cetera. It's really shifted the kind of ground uh, for how people make these decisions. And it may be that the sum of these things are, are greater, uh, the, the whole of them, rather, is greater than just the sum of the parts, that, that knowing that you have various options that you can go to, uh, you know, one day bike share, if you're going to have packages, you'd car share, um, et cetera, that, that these allow for a kind of spontaneity in ease and a flexibility that used to be associated with uh, cars, and which, uh, whereas cars may be now associated more with expense and hassle of parking and such. I don't want to overly, uh, overly uh, characterize uh, a bigger change than has happened, but as trends, these are, as you saw before, quite dramatic. Now, where do universities and, and colleges fit in? Um, I think they fit in both as um, a cause and effect, and as they can play a real kind of role, maybe playing a real role in consolidating the kind of um, particular attitudes that millennials have, that their ex experience at the campuses may help to really form what will be their lifelong preferences. And, and where uh, universities and colleges fit into this is that uh, a lot of universities and colleges are actively trying to encourage their staff, their students, their faculty not to use personal vehicles as a way to get to and from campus. Uh, this matters, as I said, um, uh, partly in a way for uh, the lifelong tastes uh, and attitudes of millennials, but also insofar as campuses are cities unto themselves with a lot of people in them, and that they also can provide experiments, the kind of laboratories for local government, or can uh, show that something works, or even by uh, collaborating with, local, with localities can help jumpstart other kinds of programs at, uh, um, at the local government level. Um, why do universities do it? Well, partly, you know, universities at least might like to see themselves as being far-sighted leaders, trendsetters, etc. But, um, you know, I, I think a real po important part of this is also just that parking consumes real precious land, and uh, universities are trying to make universities and colleges are trying to make their campus spaces these vibrant, walkable places where people like to hang out. That um, that being on campus is somewhere important. That students, after all, could be getting an online degree somewhere else. Um, and and as they plan these spaces, they are also confronted by the fact that parking is really expensive, um, not just to build, um, but also to maintain, and especially uh, for constructing multi-level parking or underground parking. You know, it can be tens of thousand dollars per space in a way that uh, there's much uh, more productive uses for this land. Uh, and any of you all who are in a university setting or a university town know how, you know, when September rolls around or late August, how uh, people who have had the summer without so many students say, oh, no, here's the students come, coming back, and how it really aggravates those very important town-gown relationships, having the traffic problems and the, all of the cars associated with the university. So it's a way of of um, improving those university relationships with that all-important um, uh, locality in which they're lo which uh, universities uh, are grounded in. Uh, universities also, uh, you know, they need to appeal to young people. They they have a product which they are selling, if you will, to to young people, and they need they know that young people, when they visit or when they just see those places, are going to be drawn to these more walkable, less car-centric places. And on the 
on the uh, sort of supply side, universities and colleges have a kind of extraordinary planning capacity that most local governments could only dream of in terms of being able to really set out a long-term master plan that will um, have profound importance for shaping decisions and that will be benchmarked against in the future for um, for trying to, to really pursue explicit goals. And I, I mentioned universities want to be environmental leaders in general, environmental leaders. There's over 600 universities who signed on to a, a climate pact to uh, reduce em emissions, which cars are a major portion of. When I talk about saving spaces and, and uh, saving space and just land use, this is one of my favorite images thinking about this. This is uh, 40 people traveling either by bus by 40 individual car, solo cars, or by bicycle. And you can really see how much space is required, how much associated infrastructure of what which would otherwise be very dead and uninvited spacing is required for those solo car trips as opposed to the, the um, uh, bus or the biking. And for that matter, if you imagine 40 pedestrians, it would be even smaller. So, um, so getting the, with the bus brings us to how um, how universities are providing access, free access often, or discounted access to transit services. Uh, a lot of universities are offering uh, you know free shuttle services. We uh, we uh, use data in our report from the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education, which listed uh, you know 104. Uh, uh, University pass or fare free transit programs that were in operation. And we heard uh, from uh, dozens of people telling us, oh, you missed this one, you missed that one. So um, I, I think that, you know, 104 is a very low estimate. This is something which is quite widespread. And then there's quite more who provide some kind of deep discount. Um, the free service, as I, as I mentioned, is not just a, a benefit because it's free, but also because it allows people to use this more spontaneously to get on without waiting for people to dig in their pockets for change, et cetera. And um, some universities, uh, such as the UNC example I mentioned, actually arrange with local transit agencies to provide direct resources to that transit agency, which is a huge advantage to those agencies. It's a kind of win-win arrangement. Uh, the transit agency uh, has more more riders which they want, but they also have riders who may not uh, travel at exactly the same times as their other peak uh, commuting hour passengers. So it allows them to stretch out that compact capacity even further. Um, an increasing number of universities are making uh, the student ID be a kind of universal transit pass that. Uh, students may or may not be able to opt out of, uh, but the, uh, the norm can be that your uh, your, tri your ID pass is already allows you to get on and use transit, and again, without having to arrange that you have exact change, et cetera. All these things really, really make a difference. Uh, the programs to promote promoting bicycle use, uh, this really dovetails with the bike share uh, Trend, which has been sweeping uh, the U.S. and other uh, and other countries, where uh, you know the, today when I went and got my uh, bike on Bike Share, I saw that if I had been a member of the un university, the poster said I could have uh, gotten my membership at only 40% of of that low already annual price, and. Um, so some do these arrangements with the bike share. Others actually provide their own bike share service. They already have the ID and billing kind of accountability information with these students, so it makes it easier. Uh, a lot of universities are now providing some kind of um, subsidized bicycles or some free. There's a set of universities detailed in that recent report which actually um, do a kind of lottery of many free bicycles for incoming freshmen if they promise that they won't bring their cars with them. Uh, 
some, a lot of universities are providing some discount bike repair services. Uh, setting up bike racks and bike parking is important. The University of Wisconsin and Madison, which saw uh, a real increase, at least in good weather, of students from 14% to 22% biking to campus uh, since 2006. One of my favorite uh, amenities that they have is when you go to a Badgers football game, if you bike there instead of the overtaxed parking, which they don't have enough of at Badgers game, if you bike there, they actually have a free valet service where there's people who will take your bike and check it and then bring it back to you after the game. So that's, again, another another one of these incentives to, to bike as your mode or at least not to own your own personal car. Uh, some universities are doing some uh, big things. This is a picture of uh, Boulder University where there's uh, – UC Boulder, rather, where there's lots of these underpasses and bridges that make it very easy to uh, get around without, uh, without having to cross rights of way with automobiles, which is, is good for, you know, uh, safety as well as just ease and the experience of getting around if you're not having to stop and worrying about if you're going to be hit by a car. It, it makes it a, a very different kind of experience. And uh, the city of Boulder did a uh, renovation of a, a number of pathways, and they worked with the university with these, setting up these underpasses, and it, it really opens up uh, the city of Boulder to people from the university to be able to get around without almost ever even seeing a car on their um, bike or their run. Um, ride sharing is something which is, is you know, a, a growing phenomenon that's really made possible by, uh, by uh, the smartphones and uh, digital, digital technology in a way that, uh, that we've always had carpooling, but you can carpool with people who would have just been anonymous but, you know, similar to the way things like Airbnb have taken off or Craigslist, these ways in which you would never be able to connect with these other people or you would, you know, in the case of something like Airbnb, you'd never be able to hold them accountable if they ripped you off or, or otherwise, um, you know, were acted badly. This is a way in which, uh, you know, these technologies make it possible and particularly if you're dealing with a universe just of students who are part of that ride sharing, there's a, a greater sense of trust that helps make that possible. Um, car sharing programs, I already um, you mentioned the way this works with bike share, but similar universities will offer discount memberships to their students and staff and really trying to encourage them to use car sharing instead of um, instead of uh, bringing their own car and parking. This matters partly because of parking, but the other thing which we found in our study, uh, a new way to go, uh, which we did about a year ago, was uh, research showing that even though some of these technologies are about driving, you know, by a shared car instead of a, or a shared ride, they matter also in changing the economics of mode choice what I mean by that is that if you already have paid for your car and it's already sitting insured in your garage and you've made all those arrangements, those kinds of fixed costs kind of tilt the deck towards driving as your default mode. You've already paid for it. You might as well use it. Um, economists like to talk about how it's the marginal costs that people make decisions based on. And if you are paying for your car trips on a per-trip basis as a marginal cost, uh, then it puts it on a, a kind of even playing field with other kinds of mode choices. So you are significantly more likely to decide to uh, bike or carpool or, or walk somewhere if you can if you have to pay for that trip as opposed to having already paid for your car capacity there. Uh, so these things are important, and they're things which universities can really um, encourage people to do and, and change their mode choice that way. Um, so the general theme here is about how universities, you know, can really um, make a difference and and show the way here that they can have concerted planning goals, say that we're going to change uh, 
how people get to and from campus at a certain rate by a certain year, and this is what we need to do, and they can benchmark around this. Um, seen how it can really reduce their own long-term costs for universities in terms of the costs for building expensive uh, infrastructure around parking, especially. Um, this, uh, how this is important in terms of meeting the demand for their customers, these young students have for uh, car-free or at least car-light lifestyles. And, and the, the last thing is how universities can, can really show the way as a kind of economic development model. Uh, their cities are increasingly uh, realizing that their economic development strategy uh, you know, depends less on chasing the smokestacks of particular companies and trying to offer the incentive to, you know, lure this company or that company that ultimately they will be doing better if they can make their city a place where young talent uh, congregates, if it is a magnet for the places which then companies want to locate and invest in in order to have access to that young talent. And I think that universities have you know, perhaps unintentionally provided a lot of uh, a lot of examples for how cities can do this. Cities think of themselves as a kind of campus for uh, for their citizens and for uh, those companies that might want to invest uh, in locating in those cities. So. Uh, there's a lot of a lot that universities have to offer and to show uh, to cities and other levels of government, and um, I'm looking forward to hearing your all questions and comments r related to this. I also hope that uh, you all will uh, look at some of the research that's been reflected in this. You can see this is a website. If you just go to usperg.org, you can make your way to it, but there's one page where all of these um, reports and a few others uh, on changing transportation patterns are located. Um, and I um, hope that you, you will turn to it, and I'm looking forward now to your, uh, your questions, your comments. Thank you very much for your time so far. Well, Phineas, thank you so much for that presentation that highlights an area of exciting and, and positive change. And, and now we have some time for a few questions from, from questions from our listening audience. And you can post your questions uh, at um, the Q&A at the top bar on your screen. Just click on that. Uh, and you can type in your questions. And we already do have a few questions for you, Phineas. The first one is, are you aware of who has done extensive focus group research with millennials in order to get systematic, more in-depth information from millennials on their travel choices and behavior? So there's uh, there's some non-public uh, data that's been done by uh, automobile companies uh, and I. I uh, it's not accessible. It, uh, all I've heard is it makes them very nervous. Um, there's also uh, publicly accessible information uh, study that was done by the American Public Transit Association where they did focus groups and um, questionnaires of millennials in, in seven cities. And I'm forgetting right now the name of that report, but you can find it at the APTA American Public Transit Association website. I'd be very interested in hearing more if other people on the phone um, know about such things and wanted me to wanted to contact me at Phineas at org. I'd uh, be very curious. All right. Our next question is: Have you met any urban planners who include mass transit, pedestrian crossings? and the cost of parking in their designs. Uh, this person ex would especially like to know of any who live in or near Erie, Pennsylvania, and she's met Daniel Hess of University of Buffalo. Are there any others? That's interesting. Um, and I, I think that that sort of gets at uh, a lot of why you have to 
I and you know others find some of these trends really exciting is that uh, some of the the costs of driving are, are externalized costs which aren't necessarily um, faced by the drivers but are faced by by other people and not just in terms of pollutions and accidents but you know land use patterns and, and such which really matter and I, I think it's very hard to try to uh, to try to put a a strict number on it. I'd be very interested in seeing. I've written down um, uh, Ms. Hess or Mr. Hess's uh, name, and I, I'll be uh, looking for that study. But I do not know of other studies which have explicitly tried to try to do that. Again, if if people uh, here do, uh, I, I would appreciate knowing it from them. Again, at Phineas at org. Okay. Uh, next question. Are you aware of any universities that have tracked what influences their programs, like UPass, have had on their alumni over the long term? Um, are there uh, are they more likely to locate in areas with good transit, such as and and other things like car share, than those who didn't have access to such programs when they were at college? There's a study that's cited in the. Um uh, a new course, the, the uh, report there, I don't have it on the tip of my tongue, but which shows a, a lasting uh, effect uh, for people. Uh, I think it's a relatively small sample size, but uh, it is an interesting kind of effect there. I, I, I think, you know, more generally, I, I would say that uh, it's something where you know, if alumni have had an experience where their campus was a place that they felt, you know, um, a sense of place that was positive and inviting and where they liked to be, that's something which universities should value when they think about how attached those alumni are going to be and how loyal they will be um, after graduation. So it's it's something which I would encourage uh, alumni offices to, to look at um, and, and hopefully there will be more research on that. I wish I could be more helpful. Okay. Our next question is, are there any examples of university-owned and operated bike share systems? Um, there is, and um, they're rare. Um, there's, there's one or two that, again, appear in that report, and I'm, I'm sorry that I don't have it at the uh tip of my tongue. Uh, one thing I, I will say is the, the thing which makes it easy is that while uh, if a city tries to have a, a bike share program or a company has a bike share program, they have to use the credit card connection and they have to, to hope that they can go and find people if they've crashed their bike or been irresponsible with their bike. And for students, universities already have a longer connection and a way to kind of find them and hold them accountable and be able to trust them for that behavior. So it should be easier to do than a city um, with, again, you know, its, its own challenges for, for scale. All right. Our next question is, where do electric vehicles fit in the transportation future? Well, that's a, a, a broad question. I, I, I think it's something... Uh, that has my research has not been on electric vehicles. What I, I will um, say, though, is there's a number of examples where universities have again been leaders on that in trying to set up uh, charging stations or using the car share, which will have um, a recharging ability. Uh, I it hasn't been my research on EV vehicles. It does seem to be something on the upswing, though. All right. Do you have a sense if automated vehicles might change the trend for millennials since they will be able to text, email, and otherwise stay connected while in their vehicle as they drive? And that, that drive is in quotes. It doesn't seem that environmental sensitivity is a major factor in millennials' travel choices. Uh, that's right. The surveys that I've seen, it's not uh, the environment. It's not the environmental decision which uh, seems to be most important. And you could 
make an argument which would say, well, this whole thing that millennials like to do this because they like to stay connected and on Facebook and online while they travel, and once cars become self-driving, then uh, that's going to be a kind of return to the driving boom or, or something. You could see an argument like that. I think that um, when we think about what self-driving cars might mean, and again, this is all speculation how – um, how it would actually work. There's all kinds of issues, such as uh, liability issues, which which are going to be very thorny to figure out in addition to the kind of technological issues. But if you can imagine a world where there's lots of self-driving cars, it would also be one in which you need to have less roadways because cars can drive much cl more closely together. And it's one in which you can imagine that then parking becomes the big problem. And so what uh, people might increasingly do is use shared use vehicles so that after they use their self-driving car, they can then send it on its way and it goes somewhere else. And so um, without the need for parking space, if you can imagine urban areas being le much less devoted the amount of their space for cars, you can imagine that this looks a lot like, uh, a, you know, widespread car sharing and almost like public transit if people are even sharing their car with somebody else as a way to, to get around. It's a very small leap from that. So I, I think it's, 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 it's very hard to, to know uh, what's going to happen, but a world of self-driving vehicles could be a world which is much less like the driving boom rather than a return to the driving boom and that it would could be a, a real boom to the urban form and uh, mean much less physical space and roadways have to be built or devoted to the car. So it may be that people are in vehicles, but whether we would regard them as more like public transit or like car share as opposed to the personal use vehicle that dominates now is a whole other question. All right. Well, it looks like we're, we're out of time. Um, so that concludes our presentation for today. And, and thank you so much, Phineas, for that excellent presentation. So now I'd like to invite you to give us some feedback by filling out this short evaluation. Uh, that is on your screen. If you're interested in earning AICP certification maintenance credits, your completed evaluation will be needed. Um, our next webinar is Thursday, May 29th, and it's on the topic of evaluation of rear-end collisions and identification of possible solutions. And so with that, I'd like to thank you once again for joining us for this Cutter webcast. And have a great afternoon. Thank you.